The USS Defiant doesn't have an arboreum. It doesn't have a creepy grade school teacher. It's Worf's apartment. It's phaser cannons attached to a warp drive that can turn invisible. It's on a five-year mission to kick ass. Hello and welcome. This is part one of the USS Defiant Retrospective. It's going to span a few videos, but in this video, we'll do a deep dive into the ship's background, design, and studio models. So let's get going. This is part one of the USS Defiant Retrospective. Starting with the background, the Defiant was a result of both a real-world and fictional necessity to have a ship permanently stationed at DS9. From a fictional perspective, the Jemadar had just blown up a f***ing galaxy-class ship, and those runabouts weren't going to do shit against the Dominion. From a real-world perspective, the producers got to Season 3 of DS9 and realized it was a bad idea to do a Star Trek show without an actual starship. Star Trek was burnt out on trekking, so they focused on war. Only they couldn't call it Star Wars because there was a cartoon or something named that. Anyway, DS9 producers lobbied for a ship to expand the storytelling possibilities. But the big boss Rick Berman was hesitant at first. He oversaw all Star Trek productions and didn't want DS9 to lose its identity as a station-bound show. So we needed a ship. And we need a ship. It doesn't have to be a big ship, but it has to be a cool ship. Dad eventually gave the thumbs up but he was busy making TNG movies and showering Voyager with attention. DS9 was the middle child. It's the Lisa Simpson, or whatever her name was, of the Berman years. Anyway, this allowed DS9's showrunners to slip under the radar and break from the tradition that a Starfleet vessel needs to be designed for peaceful purposes. They commenced with creating a ship that was meant for battle. I thought Starfleet didn't believe in warships. From those circumstances, the NX-74205 USS Defiant was born. The registry number of 74205 is a nod to Gene Roddenberry's son, Rod, whose birthday is February 5, 1974. When the Defiant debuted in September 1994, it was the first new lead designed ship since the Enterprise D back in 1987. The USS Voyager wouldn't debut until 1995. Early concept passes treated the ship like an augmented runabout. From these sketches, you can see that the ship has a cockpit, like a regular shuttlecraft, and not a traditional bridge like a starship. The designs evolved into upsized shuttles with actual bridges. Though without anything to give it scale, they still look like augmented runabouts with warp nacelles attached. Eventually, they decided to move forward with this design. It was initially intended to be a Maquis ship. At this point, this forward section looks like it has a cockpit with side-mounted gunners. So like the other concepts, this is still an upsized shuttlecraft. As the design approached completion, this concept proposed the size of the ship. At this scale, the ship is only large enough for a bridge and maybe some surrounding rooms. This figure here suggests the ship is maybe one or two decks tall. The actual size of the ship is something that the art and visual effects teams never fully resolved because the ship would vary wildly in size, but we're going to circle back to that in a minute. As you can see here, they were tentatively using the name USS Valiant. I was going to call it the Valiant at first. This is an homage to the SS Valiant from the second original series pilot, where no man has gone before. I've got a whole segment dedicated to that later in this retrospective, so stay tuned. The name Valiant was later shot down. Producer Ronald D. Moore was told that he couldn't name it anything starting with the letter V because of the yet-to-be-revealed USS Voyager. And then I was told by Rick, that I couldn't name it anything with a V because they, had, they hadn't even released the name Voyager yet, but they were going to call it something V, so I couldn't give it a V name. With Valiant off the table, Moore went with the name Defiant. I dug back into Trek lore and decided to name it Defiant after one of the, the starships in the original series. This is also an homage to the original series. He must have thought, oh yeah, remember this ship where everyone went crazy and killed each other? Yeah, let's use that name. The finished design is unlike anything seen from a Starfleet ship. There isn't a distinctive saucer section, and the warp nacelles are integrated into the body. Keep in mind that Defiant debuted before the flurry of new designs that came when Star Trek moved to CGI ships. At this point, we had the ships from the movies and a few from TNG. The Defiant's compact design was unmistakable from anything seen before. Taking a look at the hull livery, the ship's name is in solid black lettering. By this point, all other Federation ships used embellished lettering like this. So the Defiant solid black lettering is a nice callback to the lettering used on the original Constitution-class Enterprise. 
The same goes for the pennant livery. TNG era ships use pennants that look like this, while Defiant's pennants again call back to the style of the original series. Since Defiant was designed for combat, it has more armament than any previous Federation ship. Defiant employs four forward-facing phaser cannons near the warp nacelles. Instead of the continuous beam emitted from a traditional phaser array, Defiant fires phaser pulses similar to those seen during the original series movie era. Defiant also has two torpedo launchers flanking the port and starboard sides. We see these used numerous times throughout the series. At a glance, these launchers aren't distinct, but we can see them being fired from these small gaps between the ship's wedge-shaped panels. On rare occasions, we can see a traditional phaser beam emanating from the bridge area. We also see Defiant launching torpedoes from an aft launcher. Early on, it appears that Defiant's design hadn't yet been finalized during filming, because in the initial Master System display, or MSD, the ship looks slightly different. Notice how the warp nacelles are slightly smaller and angled parallel to the body. Also, the navigational deflector pod is wider from what we see in the final ship. A corrected MSD featuring the final design of the ship wouldn't appear until Season 4. This MSD reveals that the ship is about 4 decks tall, one of which has a room with a really low ceiling. This MSD also gives us a rough scale for determining the size of Defiant. If this human figure is about 2 meters tall, then the ship is approximately 120 meters long. However, the represented size of the ship varies wildly throughout the series. When we see the ship docked at DS9, the station is 1,452 meters in diameter. Judging from how the navigational deflector fits into the docking clamps, and the span between Defiant's warp nacelles, the size of the ship is approximately 200 meters long. With all of that in mind, here's a shot of Defiant next to the Enterprise E. Even accounting for depth and image distortion, the ship is well under 100 meters long in this shot. So how large is Defiant? Well, one answer is that the showrunners never fully settled on a length. And the other answer is that Defiant is always based on whatever makes the biggest dramatic effect in any given shot. For me, from a physical standpoint, working out scenes where we have this diminutive ship, Klingon ships by comparison were gigantic, were, were you know, 15, 20, 30 times the size of this, of this Defiant. How would that play, this kind of fly, flying around these gigantic ships? In a that said, size discrepancies with ships have occurred throughout Star Trek history, so this is really nothing new. On occasion, we also see the escape pods being used. They eject from a few locations. These flaps open in the forward section of the ship. Then there's another set of flaps just behind the bridge. And here, they appear to be ejecting from the ventral shuttle bay. These are the same CG escape pods used on Voyager. On the ventral side of the ship, we see a small tractor beam emitter located where the shuttle bay doors are. And yeah, the Defiant, a ship this big, has a shuttle bay which is like a Chevy Spark having a tow hitch. Moving on to the actual studio models for the ship, Defiant used both a CG and physical model during production. The physical model is about 3 feet long. What I love about these physical models is how you can notice all the craftsmanship that went into them. Here you can see the thin copper trim around the Bassard collectors. On the reverse side, you can see this mesh here that's later illuminated blue in the final effect shot. This model appears to have two mounting points, both on the top and bottom. The physical model was auctioned off in 2006 for $106,000, which would be like buying a Tesla. A few CG models of the ship were used, but they didn't always match the physical model. The most obvious giveaway was that the nav dish would be more narrow, yet taller compared to the physical model. However, the most obvious discrepancy can be seen during the opening credits. This is a CG model. But notice how the nose is lowered, and there's this gap between where it meets the rest of the hull. On the physical model, the nose is actually slightly raised compared to the rest of the hull. This was never corrected because, well, CG in 1994 was rendered on something like this. It was too expensive to redo, and they weren't concerned with some nitpicking loser on YouTube calling them out for it. Oh. So I'm gonna wrap up part one right here. In part two, I'll pick up on the ship's history, interior, and other stuff. 
With that said, I'd like to thank these folks for helping support the channel. Thank you so much for watching so far, and I'll catch you in the next video.